So let's start with the survey then and just talk about what the options are. And this will be sort of unstructured and conversational with forays into other areas. First of all, the striking uh, thing when you want to study psychoactive drugs and plants and their impact on human culture, and that's really what interests me, uh, is how drugs affect culture. After I went through Jung and, McLu and, and Iliad, my next port of call was McLuhan. And I absorbed very deeply the notion that media structure civilizations in ways that the civilizations are never aware of. And Jung, of course, talked about print and manuscript and electronic culture. He did not talk about drugs, but drugs are a form of media because they information travels through the drug to the mind. That's a medium of communication. And various societies wear drugs uh, like clothing with no awareness of their existence at all, somewhat in the way that a fish relates to water. So that, for instance, if you're in Dublin, you are swimming in the ambiance of an alcohol culture. <laughs> you don't have to be drunk to be in Dublin, although it helps, <laughs> but the, the entire society is premised on the possibility, you see. The entire society is premised on the possibility. In India, the entire society is premised on the possibility of uh, hashish intoxication and social mores, building design, uh, everything takes account of this. Cultures don't see this. We do not think of ourselves as a meat, sugar, alcohol culture. People do not walk around saying, oh wow, I'm so high on meat, alcohol, and sugar. You know, I can hardly stand it. But they are. And s certain consequences flow from that. So as I make my way through this survey, you need to bear in mind that a culture uh, takes its tone, its clothing, from the drugs that it admits. And you can know a great deal about a culture from the drugs that it excludes, the drugs that it excoriates and fears, uh, because various drugs accentuate and suppress different parts of the psyche. So these are statements about anxiety, about various parts of the psyche. Uh, the striking thing when you set out to do a cultural survey like this is you discover that our culture, the culture of, of Europe for most of us, some of us are black, some of us are Asian, but the, largely the roots of American culture lie in Europe. This is the most uh, pharmacologically impoverished cultural area on the entire planet. It has the longest history of um, disconnection from any kind of ecstatic intoxication. And the cultural forms of Europe, linear, abstract, narcissistic, and promoting of male dominance, are, to my mind, exactly what you would expect in a culture long deprived of the boundary-dissolving, numinous encounter with the vegetable mind. So uh, a lot of the cultural problems we're dealing with are based on the fact that we as Europeans have no place for drugs. We don't really know quite what to do with that. As, uh, as you move south from Europe into the continent of uh, human origins, Africa, you discover that while Africa supports a tropical ecosystem, which because that means increased speciation of plants, you would think would indicate an increased number of hallucinogens, Africa is surprisingly poor in hallucinogens. This is not well understood. As we go through this survey, I will make reference to numerous unsolved mysteries 
in the field. And I always try to do this because I'm hoping that there are graduate students listening who are looking for research topics. And there are numerous research areas where important work can be done. One of them is this question of the poverty of hallucinogens in Africa. Why? Uh, does it have something to do with the extreme length of time that Africa has been subject to human impact? Probably. Uh, because Africa is species poor generally for a tropical continent. However, uh, in the interest of thoroughness, there is one uh, hallucinogenic drug complex that should be mentioned because it raises issues that are important for the broader context, and that is uh, Ibogaine, or Tabernantha Iboga, the so-called Bawiti cults of Zaire and Gabon. Now, this is the psychedelic about which we in the West probably know the least. It has spawned no waves of social hysteria. Uh, it has not been the subject of pogroms or uh, media freakout. It's, and it's a powerful hallucinogen. And it's not only a powerful hallucinogen, but it has a, a component of sexual excitation to it which is ancillary and unusual. Uh, if you actually have ever looked into the subject of aphrodisiacs, uh, the truth is there ain't any. Uh, there are things which cause genital itching and prolonged erection and so forth, but a true aphrodisiac, a chemical which would impel you to want to have sex, there's nothing quite like that except this Tabernantha Iboga is very interesting. We tend to think of an aphrodisiac because we tend to break our heart away from our genitals as a kind of a, as a, kind of a cold thing, I think. But when you talk to these people who are taking Ibogaine, they don't talk about aphrodisiac. They say this causes open-heartedness, one-heartedness, they call it. And one-heartedness is what they are striving for in the Bawiti cult, and they achieve it. And they achieve it, uh, and it allows them to resist cultural incursions by Christian min missionaries. Bawiti <laughs> is the main cultural force that is holding back uh, conversion to Christianity uh, by these people. Uh, fang culture, the, the people who are using this Ibogaine, it's an interesting culture. It, there's a great deal of anxiety in Fang culture about divorce because and relationships between men and women. Divorce is very easily obtained among the Fang, uh, but it's always followed by extremely lengthy and protracted negotiations with the family of the divorced partner about return of dowry and a huge amount of neurosis and agony and murder and violence goes on over these dowry return negotiations. The Ibogaine stands right in the middle of this as a source of one-heartedness, making divorce less likely. So it's very important as a force for social cohesion. And I mention this because when we reach ayahuasca, we will see, I mean, when we reach South America, we will see ayahuasca functioning not as an aphrodisiac or a thing to unify couples, but as a kind of telepathic pheromone that unifies whole small tribal groups together into a one-hearted, one-minded modality. And if we get into a discussion of the possible evolutionary impact of hallucinogens, we'll see that it always lies in the direction of these collectivized states of mind and uh, dissolution of boundaries uh, between people. Other than Tabernanthe Boga, Africa's hallucinogens are trivial, and I won't mention them in the time we have. Cannabis is in Africa as well, but cannabis is worldwide now and probably has been for quite some time. 
Cannabis is a special case, chemically and culturally. We tend to think of cannabis as a recreational drug, but that's because in the 20th century we always smoke our cannabis. In the 18th and 19th century, cannabis was eaten and jellied forms of cannabis that were eaten, judging by the pros of people like Theodore Gautier, Baudelaire, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow, and people like that, it was as powerful as LSD, without doubt. I mean, these people were being swept in tight to titanically alien uh, dimensions. Well, when we cross from Africa to India, India, interestingly, of course, as you all know, tremendous depth of at least concern with the spiritual dimension, if not realization of it. That's a tougher call. Uh, uh, India um, would be a likely place to look for indigenous hallucinogenic plant cults simply because of the spiritual obsession that characterizes Indian thought. When we look at the historical foundations of Indian thought, we find that it all rests on a group of texts composed between 4,500 and 2,000 years ago called the Vedas. And the Vedas are nothing less but the world's longest continuing advertisement for a hallucinogenic plant. The problem is we don't know what this plant is. This is the mysterious soma of the Rig Vedas. And uh, Mandala 9 of the Rig Veda is an entirely a hymn to Soma. Soma held uh, Hinduism of the Vedic phase together. Later, it was repressed. And again, graduate students pay attention. One of the very interesting problems to be looked at by sociologists, social psychologists, and anthropologists is how, if a drug once discovered, or a plant once discovered, is so wonderful, how can these things ever be lost or forgotten? And yet, in several instances, we deal with literatures which sing the praises of some plant or drug, the identity of which we cannot figure out, or it becomes a, a big arm wrestle between various competing schools of scholarship. We do not, to this day, know what Soma was. Rob, uh, Gordon Wasson, who uh, some of you may know as the discoverer, the modern discoverer of the mushroom cults of Mexico, founder of the science of ethnomycology, believed to his dying breath that Soma was Amanita muscaria, the red-topped, white-speckled Amanita. Um, this is a mushroom which has a major role in Tungusic and Arctic shamanism, but to say, as Wasson did, that this is the supreme entheogen of all time uh, is not supported by the evidence, I think. Wasson's own efforts to become intoxicated on Amanita muscaria were not successful. Uh, my efforts have not been successful. Occasionally you will hear anecdotal evidence. Someone will tell a story about eating Amanita muscaria that obviously they had a staggering breakthrough to a uh, rupture of plane, as Merciliad in his wonderful phrase. But it's extremely undependable. And when you look at the botany of Amanita muscaria, you discover that its chemical constituency is seasonally variant, genetically variant, uh, geographically variant, and so forth. So often, I think, as we gain understanding of a given shamanism, we will see that it depended on an extremely deep local knowledge. And if you take what a Yakut shaman says about Amanita muscaria and attempt to apply it in the national forests of New Mexico, you know, you could end up with a tag on your toe. Uh, these things do. This kind of information doesn't travel well. One of the one of the you know there are old shamans and bold shamans, but there are no old bold shamans.
in looking at the Indian subcontinent for other hallucinogens uh, that may have made a contribution, uh, the obvious one, to my mind, is Stropharia cubensis, the mushroom which grows in the dung of cows and that the book my brother and I was, uh, wrote was about. Other possibilities, some of you may know that there are a family of uh, the Argeria family of uh, morning glories, an Asian family of morning glories distributed from India to the salt to uh, Micronesia, 13 species, all containing psychoactive ergot alkaloids, none with an, a history of human usage. Now, this is another area which really fascinates me. Uh, why do some plants become discovered by human beings and become the objects of cults which last millennia and others are never discovered at all in societies absolutely obsessed with spiritual advancement? This Argeria nervosa is a perfect example because you take the seeds, the seeds are the active part, and you don't need much of this thing. You need uh, four or five seeds, less than a tablespoon of plant material, which I would bet would make it per unit volume, probably one of the most powerful hallucinogens in nature. And uh, the hallucinations are absolutely stunning. And nobody has ever claimed this. It's free for the taking. This means you can cut a deal with an ally that doesn't belong to the Hindus, the Mayans, or the somebody else. It's an unoccupied parking space <laughs> in uh, hyperspace. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the discoveries are continuous. Uh, just a year ago, uh, some phytochemists in the Midwest discovered uh, a new a plant. It's always been there. Nobody's ever taken it very seriously, treated it like a weed. Desmanthus elenoiensis, the Illinois bundleweed. This is suggestive that it's called bundleweed because a medicine bundle is, of course, a shaman's mojo bag, you know. But so bundleweed... 6% by dry weight, NN dimethyltryptamine, the largest concentration of DMT in any plant, and unclaimed by native peoples, unknown to the folk medicine of the North American Indians as far as, as uh, we can tell. Well, so this is very interesting. Uh, Continuing our survey, uh, since we're now somewhere on the Eurasian continent, we should mention uh, 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 Papaver Somniforum, the opium poppy. With cannabis, this is probably the oldest human narcotic known. Uh, in the, the later phase of Minoan civilization was entirely based on opium on the use of opium. And in fact, when Michael Ventris translated the tablets, the Linear B tablets, they got these tallies and they thought at first that the symbol for opium must be the symbol for wheat because the tallies were so huge of the stuff being moved and sold. And then when they sorted out, they realized, no, in the, for the last thousand years of its existence, the Minoan civilization drifted deeper and deeper into an opium narcosis that was its way, I think, of anesthetizing the pain of the death of this last outpost of the goddess religion, because that's what it was. It was a cultural anachronism. While Asia Minor had gone over to God King's city states and bronze tipped spears, the people of Minoan Crete had kept the old, old archaic religion that came out of Africa. And then in the last gasp of that Minoan culture, those mysteries were handed on to the mainland of Greece and became the mysteries at, uh, at Eleusis and, uh, and other cult sites. 
it was said by the, by the commentators, contemporary commentators of the Hellenistic world, the, site, the, the rites practiced in secret at Eleusis are practiced in public at Knossos. And this, this was the difference, you know, the going underground of the old proto-Minoan mother religion. Uh, in modern times, we have a horror of opium. Uh, I mean, people are amazed that I even mention it in the same breath, but it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves that this virulently addictive substance, opium, was not even noticed to be addictive by anybody until 1627, when the English physician John Playfair, for the first time, commented that opium once taken over a long period of time, then there would be a requirement that it be taken uh, throughout life. Um, we're right in the middle of a drug war at the moment, and it's interesting in that context to uh, uh, notice how the goals of drug wars can change. A hundred years ago, uh, the British Navy was involved in what was called the Opium Wars in China. Very few people in the modern world have bothered to inform themselves to find out that the opium wars were about the right of the British government to deal opium. The Emperor of China did not want opium dealt in the ports of China. And the British government used cannon to enforce their desire to uh, sell opium in the ports of China. Why were the English trying to sell opium in the ports of China? because the tea trade had collapsed through overproduction and they were stuck with all these tea ships. They had created a whole global infrastructure for the sale of tea. When the market fell out on tea, they just turned to opium. They grew it in Goa and they sold it in China. And this was government policy less than 120 years ago. Okay, well, uh, moving on then from Eurasia, and I'm sure I'm missing different things, but if I missed your favorite thing, bring it up in the question period, uh, to the North American continent. And the North American continent is, uh, I almost said, similarly cursed like Europe, but that's just my prejudice. The North American continent is similarly poor in hallucinogens. Uh, there are no very interesting hallucinogens in North America and North American Indians, North American culture, did not avail itself of this ecstatic plant-induced shamanism. It tended more to go for what's called ordeal shamanism, the Sundance thing where you hang yourself by your pectorals on hooks and stuff like that. I mean, there are other ways to attain these visions. But you see, that absence of good hallucinogens in North America just reinforced that whole beer and woolen and uptight thing that came from Europe. Uh, the only major hallucinogen to have a role in Native American culture is, uh, of course, peyote. And many people, without informing themselves, imagine that peyote is something which goes millennia into the past, and that it, and this is absolutely not true. Peyote use may well be less than a thousand years old among Native Americans. When you go back into the old graves and the old burial sites in the Rio Grande Valley and south, you don't find peyote. What you find are the beans of Sephora secundifolia, you all probably know this plant, though you may not know its name. It's the plant that produces the very hard red and black bean that they can, can string. If you all know what colarines are, these are erythrinas, which are related to these things. Okay, that stuff contains uh, uh, cytosine and cysteine. This is, uh, these are what are called ordeal poisons. And it might be worthwhile to just talk for a minute about ordeal poisons. I said there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to have this experience that shoves you through to an awareness of the numinous, 
that's what we're trying to do is have an awareness of the numinous. Well, in certain parts of the world where hallucinogens were not present in the biome, people concentrated on ordeal poisons. And what an ordeal poison is, is it's a chemical compound that you take it and you think you're going to die and you beg for death and you do not die. You get better, you're fine. And you're so damn glad to be alive <laughs> that you undergo an ab reaction. You get straight, you shed some of your complexes and you make a, you turn over a new leaf is, uh, <laughs> is what it is. Well, in Madagascar, these ordeal poisons have been brought to a high state of perfection. Also in Malaya, there's a poison complex that replaces a hallucinogenic drug complex, and these are horrific poisons. So uh, what apparently was going on in the Rio Grande Valley was after centuries of this Sephora Secundifolia cult, someone discovered peyote and said, my God, <laughs> you know, thank God. And then the other, the other plant, which was big in the, in the uh, Southern California, Northern Mexico, and across the Southwest, were the uh, uh, tropane-containing detours, the so-called Tolach religion of Southern California. Well, these are deliriant confusants that are, unless you have a psychic constitution that is not like mine, you can't take these things. They're too, I just found them confusing. It was like a kind of madness and also physically very difficult to handle. I experimented, I had a phase with these things when I was in Nepal because there are sadhus, holy men in the Kathmandu Valley who swear by this stuff. And if you're in Kathmandu, you may notice in the gutter, well, you'll notice plenty in the gutter, but you may also <laughs> notice these deturopods, empty deturopods, and I noticed them and started asking questions. And then out at the King's Game Preserve past Pashupatinath, I found a bunch of these things and laid in a supply. And, uh, but it is an occult, watery, it's a dimension of confusion, not a dimension of high awareness. And I think some of you have heard me tell the story about the reason I gave it up was an Englishman, a friend of mine who lived in this little village in Nepal where I lived, he was also experimenting with this stuff. And one day I was buying potatoes and tomatoes in the market and I ran into him and we started having a conversation. And in the course of the conversation, he revealed that he believed we were in his apartment. <laughs> and then I knew that, uh, you know, we were, we were losing hold on our grounding. Uh, so I don't recommend that. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. Apparently, it's a, it's a thing for magic, power magic. And I've never been particularly interested in that because I'm afraid of it. I'm a, I'm a watcher. I like to look. I like to get very close to it and watch it. But I'm not into grabbing it or doing anything with it. I, I have a feeling that would lead to catastrophe uh, for me personally. Uh, okay, where are we now? Northern Mexico. Now we've gone all around. We started in Europe. We went down into Africa, across the Eurasian continent, North America, northern Mexico. Now things get interesting because as you leave the Sonoran uplands and go south in the Sierra Mazateca, uh, it is this mushroom complex which Valentina and Gordon Wasson discovered in the 1953s. 17 to 22 species, it depends on who's counting, of extremely endemic, meaning very localized species of mushrooms, all producing psilocybin, coincident with the Mayan, the cultural site of the Mayan, Mixtec, and Mazatecan civilizations. And this is psilocybin, an extraordinarily powerful, visionary, and benign hallucinogenic metabolite. 
once the Wassons had nailed down this Mexican mushroom complex, then people started checking and they discovered these mushrooms or conspecific species in many localities. Uh, two that are worth mentioning are the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, which appears to be the world center for species density of the psilocybin gene. And strangely enough, very good ethnographic research turns up no hint that these uh, Quacutl, Shimsham, Tlingit, and other people had any hint of this. They lived in the center of the psilocybin distribution complex, and as far as we can tell, their shamanism, which was highly evolved, never discovered or made use of this. Not so these civilizations of Mesoamerica. The other place where these mushrooms have now been discovered, and the range seems to be extending every year, is uh, Europe. The tragedy of European civilization is that the Logos was apparently there all the time. Uh, uh, the English countryside, I understand, is now practically a scene of annual mushroom runs that are not unlike the lemming runs of Scandinavia. And everybody pours out to, to collect the semi-lanciata mushrooms. The, I've been told, I haven't been to these sites, but I've been told that uh, Ionia, where the Book of Kells was composed and where uh, St. Columba went, is covered with mushrooms. It's very clearly a uh, mushroom ecology. Attention, graduate students, the tracing of mushroom motifs in European art and civilization and culture is an extremely rich untapped field. Uh, if you need some clues, uh, look at family escutcheons, look at family crests. Uh, in, Fran in France and the Italian parts of France, the Morelli family has the Morel on their escutcheon. Uh, there are other mushroom families and mushroom uh, names. So uh, there may have been, you know, this may have been the struggle between paganism and Christianity may have revolved uh, around a mushroom. We know druids were into plants. We know they were into oak groves. But uh, the plant that is always mentioned as the druidic, psychedelic, psychic plant of choice is mistletoe. But mistletoe is chemically very disappointing. And I've wondered if mistletoe is not... It wasn't the plant they wanted to symbolize. They wanted to symbolize the symbiosis of one plant upon another. It's that the mistletoe symbolizes epiphytic existence. Uh, anyway, this is an, un, uh, an untapped area. Once you get into the New World tropics, then you are in the great domain of, uh, of the hallucinogenic plants. And no one knows why it is that the tropics of the New World are tremendously rich in hallucinogens. I mean, I don't know how many of you are botanists or, or biologists, but try to imagine uh, figuring out a set of evolutionary constraints that were operating on one side of the planet, but not on the other. You know, when we take, for instance, the jungles of southern Colombia and compare them with, let us say, the jungles of New Guinea, these are both continental floras, both equatorial, both climaxed at a species-rich climax, and one has dozens of hallucinogens in it, and the other has none. None. Uh, this is not well understood. I mean, theories range as wildly as, uh, obviously, that South America must be where the flying saucer landed. And, uh, you know, that's where the genes were seeded. Uh, I, I confess, I'm not sure why it is. Uh, at first, I thought that it had to do with the extremely primitive state, so-called primitive, the extremely archaic state of culture 
in the South American jungles, that they represent a real Stone Age culture, where when you go into Indonesia, it may look primitive to you, but the Dutch were there before the English arrived in North America. Uh, it is it has had centuries and centuries for which, in which these things could be forgotten. But of course, then come the botanists who care nothing for ethnographic data and who simply carry out uh, plant surveys and chemical analysis of plants. They can't find these hallucinogens either. So this is a great mystery. In the tropics of, the, um, of, of Mesoamerica and uh, and uh, the equatorial tropics of the New World, there's a vast uh, panoply of hallucinogens, not only the mushroom complex, but then also this ayahuasca or yahe complex that we've referred to several times. Uh, this is a huge jungle vine. And as we cross into the yahe area, we also cross we, we cross an interesting um, barrier because we move from plants, single plants, which are hallucinogenically active, into the realm of preparations. We're on the threshold of the concept drug here because what ayahuasca is, is uh, two plants which are not active unless brought into combination with each other. One plant uh, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and the other plant contains DMT, which would be destroyed in the gut if taken orally, unless it were taken orally in the presence of an MAO inhibitor. Well, this was not understood by Western pharmacology until 1956. But it was understood by Amazonian shamans millennia ago. So they bring these two things together, and by varying the ratio between the plant containing the beta carbolines that inhibit MAO and the plants that contain DMT, they can intensify or uh, de emphasize the visions. Well, most of the um, most of the hallucinogens in the Amazon basin run on tryptamine of some sort, uh, uh, usually DMT. In the upper basin of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, like that, you get these banisteri, these uh, yahe ayahuasca beverages. These are things you drink, and then it comes on. You have these outlandish trips. As you go down into the lower basin, the Banisteriopsis cult gives way to these snuff cults, Ibina and Neopo, depending on the languages. These are, don't depend on an MAO inhibitor for their activity because they're absorbed through the subnasal mucosa, which is an extremely effective way for getting drugs uh, into the system. The problem with, these, with that complex the snuff complex is that we are just physically such delicate and wimpy people that we can't stand that root route of drug administration because what they do is they toast these seeds of Anadonanthera peregrina, this huge leguminous tree which is the source of the seeds. They toast these seeds and powder them so what you get is a kind of rough, cross between sawdust and charcoal and then they have a hollow tube about this long and they load it up with this stuff and you squat down and put the nostril the tube into your nostril and your friend your friend not you because you would not do it hard enough your friend then takes a huge breath of air and and it's just like being hit in the face with a, a two-by-four. I mean, it's like being hit in the face. And you fall over backwards, you scream, you salivate, you squirm around there in the dirt for a minute or two. And then you sit back up, and by that time, the tube has been reloaded for the other nostril. 
and then, you know, and your eyes, your sinuses can't believe what's happening to you. <laughs> so you have to sort out this whole sinus shock, which is going on in parallel with then an evolving strange state of mind, which is beginning to take over and, uh, and clarify everything. And then there are numerous minor variations uh, on these themes. Uh, might talk just a little bit about the chemistry of these things and the chemistry of hallucinogens generally. My attitude toward uh, these, uh, this question of plants, compounds, drugs, should these things be used for spiritual growth? Uh, if the answer is no, then that finishes. You don't have to go any further. If the answer is maybe or yes, then other questions arise. Which compounds out of this whole survey and at what frequency and at what dosage and under what uh, circumstances? And over the years, I've sort of evolved a three-way test that I will share with you because I think it's maybe the, operationally the most useful thing you'll hear this weekend. And that is, if you are contemplating some, some compound, some plant, then the first thing to ask yourself is, does it occur in nature? Does it have some tangentiality to what is already existing. Because obviously what exists, that's nature, has undergone some uh, vast winnowing process out of the set of all things which might exist. In that wonderful phrase of Alfred North Whitehead's, certain things have undergone the formality of actually occurring. <laughs> you know? And, the, and, and so certain, dr certain compounds have undergone the formality of actually occurring in the biological matrix. And so they should be, they should be our pool out of which our experimental compound should be drawn. But this is thousands of compounds. How can we further narrow it? Well, uh, an excellent way of narrowing it further is to ask the question of this compound, does it have a history of human usage? Does it have a history of human usage? That is your uh, FDA approval. <laughs> because if you can point to a tribe of people who have been taking this plant or mushroom or whatever it is for millennia, and they don't have miscarriages, tumors, cataracts, blindness, Down syndrome, eight fingers on the left hand, or whatever it is, then you can be fairly confident that this thing is benign, that these people have observed its action on pregnant women, the elderly, the, those with, you know, and, and that it has passed uh, uh, that test. Then, finally, the, mo the narrowest gate through which a compound has to go to to intersect my precious body, is it has to have an affinity to ordinary brain chemistry. It has to have an affinity to ordinary brain chemistry. We don't want to launch something on your brain that it can't recognize at all, that it has no biosynthetic pathways to degrade, that it has no receptors for just some crazy thing, you know, 5-amino-3-triethylphenthioanaxidine or something. We don't want that. This is not the spirit that we're acting in here. Uh, so if the compound can get through those three barriers, then it's an excellent candidate for uh, providing spiritual gain at low physiological uh, impact. Well, now some people may say, oh, well, you've taken all the fun out of it. All the good things have been tossed aside in this mad rush to purity or something. Not at all. <laughs> the very best stuff was retained in this process because uh, in terms of relative strength and bizarreness of effect 
and so forth, the strangest, the most powerful, the most transformative of all hallucinogens in nature or out is dimethyltryptamine, DMT. And uh, it's worth talking about DMT for a moment because it will raise certain issues and distinctions that you may not have been aware of. First of all, DMT is hands down the most powerful of all hallucinogens. I mean, it is so powerful that whatever is in second place is lost over the horizon. <laughs> yet, yet, it is the most benign of all hallucinogens because it occurs as an endogenous neurotransmitter in the normal human brain. We, every single one of us at this moment, have NN-dimethyltryptamine being synthesized, activated, and degraded in our uh, synaptic membrane. So this is almost a paradox. The most benign of all hallucinogens, the most fast-acting, I should also add, is also the most harmless, the, the easiest to take. It sort of remove, it sort of puts a certain obligation on the experience because there is no reason to hold back except that there is this question, uh, does it drive you mad? And then the more serious version of that question, what about the possibility of death by astonishment? <laughs> This is no joke. Uh, death by astonishment is, I, I think, probably the major risk we run uh, with this stuff because the impact of the breakthrough is, uh, is so total, so complete, so unexpected. And in a way, this sort of brings me back around to my theme because I encountered DMT, LSD, all of these things in that very period when I was getting set to uh, take flight as a Jungian analyst. And what completely blew my mind about DMT, and uh, I mention it in a, again, here's an opportunity for research, is how tran here's a heretical construction, how trans-archetypal the content of the flash seemed. I was appalled because not only had I a certain amount of interest in Jung and proclivity along those lines, but my original major had been art history. Art historians, what we're trained to do is to be able to look at a motif and say, oh yes, I'm familiar from, with this from ceramic from second millennia Peru and also Mandayan uh, uh, embroidery work. We know motifs. We're trained to recognize and connect disparate aesthetic domains. Well, when I smoked DMT and came down, I said, you know, this is not on the map. I can't believe it. Th this doesn't connect up to anything. How can there be domains of the human mind that do not announce themselves in folklore, fairy tales, dreams, or mandala painting that are so removed from the ven of what is human that they are apparently not accessible in structuring our uh, maps of our self and our psyche. And that for me was the contact with what I call, and I didn't call it this, Rudolf Otto called it this, and this term influenced Jung, Otto preceded Jung, was it is the holy other. And if there is an archetype of the holy other, then this is it. But perhaps the holy other transcends the archetypes. This may explain to some degree Jung's interest in Gnosticism, especially the Valentinian school of Gnosticism, which holds, you know, that there is a higher and hidden Father, all God, who is outside the machinery of cosmic fate. And it seemed to me that in those extremely profound DMT flashes, I was actually witnessing a domain outside the machinery 
of the archetypes, which is for us as moderns, that's what the machinery of fate is. It's not zodiacal machinery, it's hardwiring in our psychology and our genes that gives us our fate. Well, so having said that, uh, I've not only made the, the survey, but also brought us to, by ending with DMT, the subject matter of this quest. And I want to make it clear, I speak about the power of the psychedelic experience because I think people should be informed of their birthright. And I feel very antsy around the notion that someone might go from birth to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience. It makes me as antsy as the notion that somebody might go from birth to the grave without having a sexual experience. It's a strange kind of uh, protective denial or a, a, a kind of expression of fear. This is our birthright. This is part of what it means to be human. These altered states of consciousness, I think, are pretty much scripted in to the existence of women because they, most of them, will give birth, which is an organically scripted psychedelic experience from which there is no escape unless, of course, you go for the drug knockout, the spinal, and then you miss everything. But biologically, physiologically, women are set up for uh, this experience. Men are not. It's possible to build such barriers against overwhelmment that it never happens in your whole life. And I believe that if we psychologically analyze the effects of these uh, psychedelics, what they do is they dissolve boundaries. That's all. I mean, if you interview 10,000 people who've had a psychedelic trip, each one has their own hierophany, their own hieroscamos that unfolded for them. But the sum total of it is boundaries dissolve. And then whatever's on the other side of your boundary comes flooding in to claim you and to, and to reshape and remake your psyche. Well, I see the entire illness of our civilization as an, as an ego inflationary illness. We have gone so sick with ego that we are literally murdering the planet rather than confronting the consequences of our uh, psychic imbalance. And uh, the psychedelics act to redress this. They are almost an inoculation against the ego. And I, I see the ego as a phenomenon arising in historical time, or ra rather, actually, history is caused by the ego. But the ego is a component of the psyche that arose in the post-archaic phase, in the post-psychedelic phase. Uh, it's entirely a modern invention. It's less than 15,000 years old. And the assumptions of the ego are the source of our neurosis, our disequilibrium. Why did the ego arise? It arose because of the climatologically enforced abandonment of these psychedelic religions of the archaic period.